Subscribe now. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, welcome to the Bigfoot Influencers Podcast. My name is Tim Halloran. I want to thank each of you for tuning in uh, to our very, very first episode. So super excited about that. Uh, I'm joined today by my co-host, Dana. And Dana, do you want to say hello? Yeah. Hi, guys. So my name is Dana Halloran. And I just want to, you know, introduce myself and also talk a little bit about our show, our podcast. Um, our guests on the face on, on our Bigfoot Influencers podcasts um, include individuals from all spectrums um, of the subject of Bigfoot. Um, and we'll be getting to know a little bit about everyone and what they do. And we're going to be trying to get the answers to the questions that you want to know. Um, so I thought maybe we would spend a few moments um, just to get to know Tim and I. So I'm Dana Haller and he's Tim Haller. And so we're not brother and sister. <laughs> we're husband and wife. And um, we got interested in the subject of Bigfoot. And that's because of me. Um, I use we Tim and I have four boys together. And we um, I used to watch um, finding Bigfoot a lot with my, our youngest son, Gabriel, and he was obsessed with it. And we watched it a lot and got really super interested. Even though, even when I was a little girl, I was really interested in the subject of Bigfoot. I remember always going to the library, uh, you know, as a, a little girl in elementary school and always wanting to get books about the Loch Ness Monster and ghosts and Bigfoot and things, you know, unexplained. And so when Finding Bigfoot came out, I just got all reinterested in it. Tim thought I was like a little wacky or whatever, till I finally convinced him to go to the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. And I guess that was like, what, like five years ago? So yeah, it's like five like years ago. Um, and so we went and Tim was like, he didn't know anything about anybody. Um, so we walk into the the lounge of the you know of the conference because we were renting a cabin and i um saw dr jeff meldrum checking in and i'm like oh my god baby don't move <laughs> it's dr jeff i was so, like so starstruck and um so then tim you can go ahead and tell them yeah so so i you know i knew who he was but really didn't have a ton of interest at that more at that time about bigfoot i you know, watched the Patterson Gimlin film and I thought it was cool. I just never was just kind of never, never went anywhere with it. So we're in the lobby and we, uh, we, we meet Dr. Jeff. I'm kind of cracking jokes with him and just, you know, like it's nothing like he just, I say, Hey, I, I think I kind of know you. Who are you? You know, anyway, um, long story short, we, uh, we continue to, to, to do things like this. Uh, I came up with the idea to write a book. Mm -hmm. And um, the book is called The Bigfoot Influencers. Yep. And the goal of the book really was to, you know, I listen to podcasts, you know, with conferences, watch TV shows and documentaries and things like that. And I, I found it a struggle to uh, try to figure out who's doing what in the in the Bigfoot world. I, I knew, you know, you, you listen to these podcasts, you try to track everyone down. So I said, hey, how can I... How, how do I know who's doing what? So I came up with an idea to write the book. I said, hey, what if we, I try to put a bunch of people in one book so the readers could uh, to have everyone in one place? Obviously, I can't do everyone in one place because there's a ton of researchers out there that are doing great things. Uh, that was the concept of the book. So uh, part of the book is where, you know, we're asking some personal questions so the readers get to know a little bit about the researchers or the investigators or the influencers because they're not all researchers. And then the other part of the book is really diving into the topic. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about the book a little bit later. And we're just thrilled tonight. So this is our inaugural uh, podcast. We're joined tonight by uh, Mr. Daniel Perez. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who may be you know, joining this uh, for the first time or may not be really in tune uh, you know, yet with the, with the Bigfoot world, uh, Daniel Perez has been uh, involved for over 40 years. He's, uh, he's collaborated with many of the early researchers He uh, and, and continues to do so today. Daniel also has the largest uh, collection of physical files on Bigfoot in the world. So it's pretty impressive. Um, 
a lot of the, the researchers, if they need historical information, they'll go to Daniel first because they know he's got, he just, he's like a walking encyclopedia. You guys are going to be so happy to have him and, and hear him. We're, we're just thrilled. Uh, Daniel got started. Um, I'm going to give you a little pre preliminary on Daniel. Also, he got started in the Bigfoot world at the age of 10. He uh, went to see uh, the legend of Boggy Creek that hooked him. And then from there on, it just, it took off. It sparked his interest in the subject. It grew over time. Uh, it was just an, and it was an honor, Daniel's to feature him in, in volume one of the Bigfoot Influencers book. And I guess that's about it. Um, yeah. I mean, so basically my little interest in Bigfoot le ended up leading into Tim writing a book about the researchers. Basically. Of <laughs> so. And also led us to being able to meet Daniel. So I think we should just go ahead and welcome Daniel into the show. All right. Well, we're going to bring Daniel in. Yay. Hey, Daniel. Oh, I'm delighted to be on your show. Yay, Daniel. We're so far away because we're all the way on the East Coast and you're all the way in California. It's still okay with technology. It's like we're sitting right next to one another. It happens, doesn't it? <laughs> Isn't that the truth? So, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, I thought we would say how we met. Daniel. So we, we met Daniel at the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. He was speaking there in August of 2020. Um, so we listened to your presentation, which was amazing. And you're such a great speaker. And we were just like really amazed of how great you presented everything. And then um, at the end of the conference, we had the pleasure of um, being invited to a dinner uh, with you. Um, that was uh, put on by the organizer, uh, Mark Deworth, of the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. And um, you sat right next to me. And one thing that stuck out to me most, Daniel, was like, you sat next to me, you're like, hi, I'm Daniel. I'm like, hi, I'm Dana. And you were like, so Dana, what interests you about the Bigfoot phenomenon? So I, I was just really struck by that because I, I feel like some of the Bigfoot stars, researchers, whatever, they get a little wrapped up in that whole world of, you know, uh, being in the Bigfoot world and speaking. And you were just so personable and still so curious about people. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, but I don't know if you remember that moment. I do remember it very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, curiosity is what still keeps me going in the Bigfoot field. And I'll tell you right now, after four decades of investigating and researching the phenomenon, I'm absolutely convinced that North America has an unknown primate that we call Bigfoot or Sasquatch in the yeah. flesh and bones. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we've come to realize that too, just from educating ourselves on the subject. We're not researchers, uh, we're not witnesses, mm -hmm. but we're definitely super curious about everything that's going on, for sure. So I, I thought, you know, maybe we'll get to know you a little bit before we ask you like maybe some personal questions, not too personal, don't worry. But um, so one thing that stuck out to me was from Tim's book, The Bigfoot Influencers, um, you mentioned that Yosemite, California was one of your favorite places to visit. And so I was just wanted to ask you what you what makes that place so special? Just the view. I mean, okay. one, there's different entrances to Yosemite but once you get in there, the, the entrance that takes you through the big tunnel and you get out and you see El Capitan to your, I guess, to your left, and then straight ahead, you see uh, Half Dome and you just, you're just in awe because it looks like when God made the world, he put overtime into Yosemite. It's just so <laughs> spectacular. A friend of mine, Kenny Brown from Colorado, was just up there with a buddy hiking, and uh, I wish I could do that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have that type of time. But if I were to tell anyone, you know, what would be one place to see, I would say, well, don't go to an amusement park. Go to something that Mother Nature has built. And I would say once you get to Yosemite, you're going to want to go back. It's so that I think that's, I think we should go check it out because yeah, <laughs> we're all into that. We just, we're, we just went to, um, to Sedona 
it was my first time. And I think I had a similar experience to what you're describing. It was just mother nature just painted the perfect picture of what landscape should look like. Well, so, mm -hmm. let me interrupt for a second. I've been to the Grand Canyon in 1981 and it's, it's very nice, but if I were to compare the Grand Canyon and Yosemite, I would, Yosemite would come out on wow. We're going to have to check it that's out. That's definitely cool. <laughs> so Daniel, uh, you, you're also, in the past, you were a long distance runner and you're involved in that. Uh, how, did you, how did that happen? How did you get involved in long distance running? I started running in high school because my buddy was, one of my best friends was running in high school and I thought I would get on the track team and the cross country team. So I eventually went out my sophomore year in high school and I was okay. I didn't get really good until much after high school when I started running on my own and training myself. And I guess towards my mid thirties, I think I was at the top of my game and I would enter races with no bid because I had really nothing to prove. I knew I would beat the club <laughs> and I did not. But that may have been 25 pounds ago, maybe 30 pounds ago, <laughs> and that's mid 30s, and now I'm 59. So instead of running, I do jogging. Good. Gotcha. So was there a part of that, any of your running experience in life, that really uh, sticks out to you? A moment while you're running that was special. Ah. Uh, I never had a stopwatch on it, but I had a course marked out on in Norwalk where I grew up. I painted on the curb. I don't do graffiti, but I put little marks with a spray can where the mile marks were. <laughs> and so only I knew that. If someone would walk by that sidewalk, they would say, I wonder what that little green slash mark is on the curb there. <laughs> I put those there. And so those were the mile marks. And so I guess at the peak, I was probably zipping along each mile around 4.55. Oh, wow. That's... So that was in training. And I knew I was going fast. And that's why I put the markers up. And I did have a stopwatch. But on this particular run, everything just clicked. And I was, I was moving out. So that was one of my greatest runs. And it was on the roads. And it was a strictly a training run. That's super cool. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. great to be. I ran track too in high school, and that was a fun thing for me. So outside of work and Bigfoot, what do you like to do in your free time? Let me go back. Well, talk about free time. So when I do have free time, uh, because of my interest in running and track and field, I've been to eight Summer Olympic Games. Whoa. Um, see all the track and field, and I've also been to eight Summer world championships to go follow all the track and field and in july just a few months ago i was in eugene oregon for the world championships of track and field and i bumped into bigfoot in the stadium <laughs> the legend. It was yeah the I, I remember seeing those uh the, the the images that's that's amazing that's so cool and and we may dive into that because there's some other things you did on that trip too that we mm -hmm. we may talk about a little later so yeah. Yeah. so daniel i wanted to know what was the first uh conference that you attended you know because i think i think we also need to like bring it back for a second for some people who aren't really that involved in the bigfoot world there are lots of conferences going on around the country all the time regarding this subject um, mainly Bigfoot, but there's also like cryptids and, you know, all kinds of things going on. So this is that we happen to have met Daniel at the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. So what Tim is asking is, what was his first Bigfoot conference? Uh, my first Bigfoot conference, I believe, was June 1989 in Pullman, Washington at the international, the now defunct International Society of Cryptozoology. It was their general meeting, but the general meeting focused on Bigfoot and such celebrated people that were there. I'll rattle off the names. And for those people who follow the subject, these are really big names now. Bob Titmus, John Green, Rene DeHinden, Paul Freeman, uh, and I was there as well, Grover, Dr. Grover Krantz. And that meet was poorly attended. Uh, it was a different world back then there was no internet and also dr grover krantz was there 
And so anyone could walk into that meeting for free. There was no admission charge. So mm. the whole conference idea was quite a bit different than what it is today. There was no dinners or anything like that. If you wanted to go get a bite to eat, you were on your own. It was just a conference. And it was a very good conference. And uh, luckily, there were a few people that recorded all the, the events. And that was my first time in June of 1989, physically meeting uh, John Green, who I wanted to meet for quite a while. But I had met Rene de Hinden uh, early on in 1980. So while I was still in high school when he was in Los Angeles. And so, so now you're, I mean, something else that you're really super famous for is you are the creator of the Bigfoot Times. So like what inspired you to create, because the big, why don't you tell us a little bit about what the Bigfoot Times is? Well, the Bigfoot Times is a Bigfoot Times newsletter or mm -hmm. page goes out every month to a membership and we've got members all around the world. But I think our biggest, I've never really counted, our biggest membership is in the state of Ohio. We have more members in Ohio for whatever reason than anywhere else in the world. <laughs> This is why I don't like to piss off the people in Ohio. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're a great group. And uh, so I guess when I started the newsletter in 1998, in 1997, I was at McDonald's and I myself was subscribing to a lot of other people's Bigfoot newsletters. There was one, two, there was probably getting four of them and they were paper newsletters because the internet wasn't that big at the time and I was getting these in the mail. And I thought to myself, you know, these newsletters could be a little bit better in quality, better in scholarship. And it, every time I would drop a note to these people, it, it seemed like I was being ignored or something. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to throw my hat into the ring and start up my own newsletter. And so at McDonald's on a napkin and a pen, I scribbled down how it should look and everything. And the next thing I went to a Office Depot, Office Max, whatever they called it, and bought my first laptop, an IBM ThinkPad. And I launched the Bigfoot Times newsletter. And I guess we had maybe the first year, maybe under 50 people, and then it grew from there. And so, now we're in January of 2023, we'll mark 25 years of continuous publishing. So I'm just absolutely ecstatic. And the people who do get the newsletter, they really enjoy it. It's hard hitting, it's factual. It also provides entertainment too. So, and people like to have literature, not digitally, but actually in their hands. And so- yeah. The newsletter gets mailed to the membership and that's how they read it. And I for know it, that we're super excited when we get ours. I see that yeah. little envelope coming from California and I'm like, oh, I know what this is. <laughs> for, for, for under 20 bucks a year, I always say it's the best deal in Bigfooting period. It is. And it is. Daniel, what I'm going to do here for the, for the viewing audience is I'm going to share a couple images for, for them to see. And this is a, uh, this is actually a, well, you explain to the audience what this is. This is our 25th commemoration of the newsletter. Uh, so this is our shirt celebrating the 25th anniversary already printed and done. And so on the 25th, we'll have these shirts available, even though they're being sold right now. Awesome. And then here's for the audience, here's a, a sample of uh, what the Bigfoot Times looks like. There it is. And in fact, you have the latest edition right in front of you. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we covered the London trackway 10 years after the fact. Well, wow. so was it always on the same color? Always the same color. I guess you call it sunburst yellow. I just enjoyed the color and I went with it and I don't, I've yet to have a complaint. Awesome. That makes it like something that you can recognize right away. Definitely. Yeah, that's so, awesome. So Daniel, um, you have, a, again, the largest collection of, of items, uh, more than items. I mean, you've got books, articles, reports. What, what inspired you to start collecting those types of things? 
it was funny because when I was much younger in my teens, my dad, an electrical engineer, subscribed to the LA Times. Actually, he didn't subscribe to the LA Times. Back then, it was easy to get it out the newspaper rack because there was many of them. And so he'd bring the LA Times home and I'd, after he was done, I'd look at the newspaper. And every once in a while, I'd find a newspaper clipping about Bigfoot and I would uh, take the scissors and clip it out. And I started putting them originally in a J.C. Penney shoebox. And so that's how my files originally started. And it just, one thing led to another. And the next thing you know, I've got massive files. When the late Warren Thompson passed away, I believe it was 2013, from the Bay Area Bigfoot Group in the Bay Area of California, he willed his massive files to me so i got all of that in addition to what i had and so that made me far and away the largest holder of physical files on bigfoot in the world from newspapers journals books and everything in between so that kind of makes you like an expert like bigfoot historian yes it does and in mm -hmm. fact uh Michael Freeman, the son of the late Paul Freeman, just made some inquiries about looking for some information in newspaper clippings, which I just completed a couple of days ago. So it's not something we advertise on the website, but if someone says, hey, can you check into this? And if I have time, uh, generally I'll go to the newspaper clippings and say like, ah, I found the newspaper clipping you're looking for. Yeah, and that's super cool. And that's definitely that was another thing that we wanted to talk to you about later was the Freeman footage. Um, so, you know, what are what are what are what is maybe one of the most unique items that you have in your collection? Would you say the rocks from the Patterson Gimlin film site? Okay. So the, the film was shot in October of '67. Right, and this is the film that the classic film that everybody has seen with the Bigfoot walking across and Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin were filming this. Yeah. And it's a classic film that we've all seen growing up. Mm -hmm. Right. So that film, less than one year later in June of 1968, John Green and Jim McLaren and George Haas, uh, the only person living now is Jim McLaren, but not in the United States but they went to the film site so John Green could make a recreation footage of where Patty, as the subject in the film is called, walked to see if they could recreate it with Jim McLaren as the model because Jim McLaren in Boots was about six feet, five inches tall. And so to their utter surprise, they found that even after those many months, that some of the footprints still remained in the sandbar. Wow. You have to really go to bluff to the film site to understand that that type of soil and sand holds prints remarkably well. And so when George Haas was there, he saw one of the footprints where Patty had stepped on some rocks. And so he just picked those rocks up from the footprints as a souvenir. So when George Haas, one of the original Bigfooters, passed away, he willed his collection to Warren Thompson. So when mm -hmm. Warren Thompson passed away, I got all of this stuff. So I have, I think, three or four rocks that Patty came in contact with, and they're like my souvenirs now. So I know that those rocks Patty stepped on because the tracks were still there after that many months. So that's, that's super that, cool. That's wild. Yeah. <laughs> that is super. So, cool. so Daniel, you as you you bring that up, uh, most people think of the Patterson Gimlin film and they just think of the video, or they think of the Patterson Gimlin film, but they don't realize the the a little bit of the history of what was going on in that area and the tracks that were found. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the tracks? Well, prior to the film. There was the Blue Creek Mount Mountain incident, and that was from the summer of 67, just a few months earlier. And Rene DeHinden and John Green flew down to investigate. And they were of the opinion, a lot of people think the Blue Creek Mountain tracks were fake, but I, 
I don't necessarily subscribe to that idea because I had enough discussions with John about the Blue Creek Mountain Tracks. And he basically told me that, you know, I was there physically looking at those tracks. And I think there was like a 13 inch track, a 15 inch track, and another track. I think there was two or three individuals seen up on Blue Creek Mountain. Blue Creek Mountain, as the crow flies, is maybe six miles away, less than not, from the Patterson Gimlin film site. So that was the summer of 67. They go back home to Canada and Roger Patterson hears about the track report. And so he comes down in early October with Bob Gimlin and their whole intent was to get, uh, see if they could get some film of more tracks in the ground uh, for a documentary that Roger wanted to make. But instead of seeing the tracks, they got a double bonus. They actually got a film of the track maker and they got to see the trackway of the track maker and they made plaster of Paris castings of the tracks. And it is now, some 50 years later, the most famous piece of evidence for the existence of Bigfoot. And, uh, I mean, it's been argued back and forth, but what you see in that film was not a man in a costume. It's just like you see the muscle expansion and contraction. And uh, so if you take the position that Roger faked the film, Roger Patterson, that what was he doing faking a film like that when he could have been commanding huge amounts of money in Hollywood doing costume work? And it, it just doesn't make sense at all. It's interesting because, you know, that was like a question I was going to ask you down the, the, the line. Tim, Tim had told me he saw this documentary um, that I think was based off a book of a guy named Greg Long. Do you know anything about that? Um, uh, Greg, Greg Long is an author who took the position that the Patterson-Gimlin film was fake and his book was called The Making of Bigfoot. I believe it was published in 2004, 2003, right around there. Right. And he, his position was that Roger Patterson was like a con artist and therefore his film is fake too. And that it was made of horse hide, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, uh, so-and-so, a now deceased costume maker. I can't think of his name right now. Philip Morris. Philip Morris who's the late Philip Morris, that he bought a costume from Philip Morris and that that was the costume used to make the film. But I believe it was National Geographic who came in after Greg Long and they got with Philip Morris and they got with the alleged guy who was in the suit, quote unquote, Bob Hieronymus, also from Yakima, Washington, and they tried to do their own recre recreation film because everything was apples to apples now. You had the guy that was allegedly in the costume. You had the exact costume that, as per Philip Morris, the same type of camera, and only a few seconds, a few seconds of that film exist on YouTube, which you could see it's kind of spliced together but I guess they were so embarrassed by the result that it never found its way to television or a documentary. They pretty much said, uh, this is something different. Because well, if they, they did were... make it to a documentary. No, not the, oh, just talking oh. about the National Geographic. Yeah, I'm, I think the reason why I want you to explain this is because there is this documentary out there where Bob Hieronymus is actually saying that Bob or um, Roger Patterson paid me to wear this suit and I just think that, you know, that just needs to be explained. I didn't know if you have actually seen it or not, because. Well, yeah, I think what you're referring to is a, a, uh, a UK production that was called the X Creatures. And that was, I guess, with a fellow by the name of Chris Packham. But, but going back just a bit here is that if you take the position that Bob Hieronymus claims that Roger was going to pay him $1,000 right. back in 1967, 
you could probably buy a home in Yakima for maybe eight thousand dollars. So that was a huge amount of money. So well, for, I think Bob also claimed that he never got paid. That's either. correct. So right. for for Bob Hieronymus to get stiffed a thousand dollars and to keep quiet all those years, that just doesn't make any sense to me because mm -hmm. here he was. He jumped into a costume, so he says. The film became uh, very famous after it was starting to be broadcast all over the place. So why wouldn't he demand his money by early 69 or 70 or 71, 72, 73? Nothing. He doesn't come to light till late 90s when Roger is long gone and doesn't have... He can't rebut what Bob Hieronymus is saying. And Bob was shopping his story to the highest bidder in the tabloids and uh, stating that Roger stiffed me on $1,000. Well, why, why didn't that story emerge back in the late 60s yeah. to get his money? It was never out there, period. So that's why there's another problem with the story of Bob Hieronymus. And I appreciate your explanation because when Tim told me he saw this documentary, I was like, what? That doesn't sound right. So I thought that was that would be definitely something to talk about with you, being that you're such an expert on the film and the people in it and the history of it, you know, obviously. Well, here's so, another thing that most people do not realize, that in the early 80s, the late Eric Beckjord, who was involved in Bigfooting, actually went down to the PG film site with the Kodak K100 camera and a, a guy who jumped into a gorilla costume and he made a film trying to could do apples to apples to see if he could recreate that Patterson Gimlin film. And the late war, I never saw the film, but the late Warren Thompson from Redwood City, California did see the film because Eric showed it to him. And he told me it was like night and day. So it looked nothing like the PG film. So the I someone they've 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 come at me and they're saying, well, no one has ever tested a guy in a gorilla costume at the PG film site. Well, let me correct you. They have. Eric Bechtor did that and he made a film of it with a Kodak K100 camera just like the one that Roger Patterson used. And that test, in that test, they failed miserably. Interesting, okay. interesting. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned, you've mentioned a few researchers, Daniel. I kind of want to go back to that uh, briefly. Um, can you share anything about some of the your, your interactions with the early researchers? And then maybe we can kind of get a funny story after you, you share a little bit about that. Well, some of my colleagues back in the snail mail days and the long distance phone calls that actually did cost money was with Rene DeHinden, with John Green, with Grover Krantz, not so much Bob Titmus because he was kind of an independent and a little bit with Tom Steenberg. Uh, I didn't meet the Russian Dmitry Bayanov till 2001. And I didn't meet Bob Gimlin physically till 1990. And I didn't meet Jeff Meldrum till about 1996. Gotcha. So are there any funny, is there a funny story you can share or something? Yeah, I know, especially well, with maybe, go ahead. Tom Steenberg is a per, probably the, the most famous uh, Canadian Bigfoot researcher alive. And so we were up after a Bigfoot meet in Canada we decided to go out for a little bit uh camping out in the woods and so we started to go into some caves to just kind of see what was in there uh hoping to see a bigfoot but nothing and so on the way out of the cave uh there was a lot of branches from the trees so i didn't know it at the time but tom steenberg was he wasn't smoking his pipe he had his pipe in his mouth and so I, I took the branch and I kind of pushed it out of my way and I completely forgot that Tom Steenberg was behind me. And so the next thing I know is it goes back and it hits his pipe. And I guess his pipe is two pieces. 
And I turned around and I realized that I hit Tom with the branch and only the front part of the pipe is sticking in his mouth. And we both got a roar out of that. So I apologize for that. That's awesome. Are, are there any, are there any early researchers that most of us that, you know, are enthusiasts may, are there any that no one's really heard of or any of that aren't mainstream that really stick out to you as one or two that many of us may not know about? Well, Bob Titmus, Bob T Titmus by his own admission, he never really saw or even cared about publicity or being famous. He just kind of did his own thing. But in terms of finding tracks and casting tracks, he was one of the top people in the early days of Bigfooting from Northern California to uh, castings in British Columbia as well. So he was very good at that. And he ma made more than, I wanna say 10 is the number that has been collected of Plaster of Paris castings from the Patterson Gimlin film site. But I think that number is actually closer to 12 because John Green admitted to me in 2000 that one of the plaster castings from the PG film site was given from Bob Titmus to a lady friend of his, an original casting from the PG film site. So that there's one, possibly two castings. So he just gave it to his lady friend, like a bouquet and, of roses or? <laughs> yeah. so it's, it's probably in the trash by now, but. Oh my God, that's crazy. That is the best physical evidence ever collected from the famous movie. <laughs> and it, it's like, it's almost like, uh, me giving you the hope diamond or something like that and you're thinking but she it, had no idea probably <laughs> the, lady, the lady probably had no idea what it was all about and probably right. after the relationship ending it just probably just got tossed in the trash she right. probably used it as a doorstop <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy yeah, but bob titmus was the real deal and he, he's always he never really comes up as one of the major ones, because he never really got that much publicity, but he was one of the major investigators back in the day. And I had the privilege of being out in the field with him in Bluff Creek, October, November of 1987. And it wasn't even a planned meeting. I just happened to be there and he just happened to be there. Wow. And we were the only two guys in the valley because I, we had both driven all around. And I drive up to this old guy and he's in a Baja Volkswagen. And I just happened to roll my window down. And I said, I said, you wouldn't happen to be Bob Titmus, would you? And he says, yeah, that's who I am. And I told him, I said, boy, you sure have aged since I saw you in John Green's book. And we both got a laugh out of it. And we spent several days together and he explained to me all of his big footing and his sightings. And so one of his sightings happened in 1963. So I didn't meet him till 1987. And so you think about it this way, he's there by himself. And so if his 1963 sighting, I think he was in the serve, no, this is, he's by himself in Gardner Canal, British Columbia. He sees, I think three of them going up a cliff. So if that sighting was just all BS, what would he be doing in Bluff Creek looking again for Bigfoot? unless he absolutely knew that they're out there because he had seen some in 63. He was by himself, so it would be a case of self-delusion, and he was there. So when I saw him there, it was just more confirmation to me that they're out there. So I, I actually think that, that Daniel might be like the one person who knows more of the researchers than anybody else. That, I mean, because, you know, the Tim's book is all about interviewing all of the influencers of the Bigfoot world, whether they're researchers or, you know, speakers or people who are curious or whatever, um, fake, real, hoaxers, you know. But I think, Daniel, that you might actually know more of the researchers that Tim has interviewed in his book. So I have to ask you the question, would it, I mean, I don't know if you've gotten through the book. I know you've read through some of it, but what do you think of it? I think it's wonderful. And it's just like, 
I never really thought about the idea of a book called The Bigfoot Influencers, but as I explained early, earlier is that when the internet got up and running, people started doing things with it and along comes Facebook and all these other platforms, Instagram and whatever. And then the term social media influencer started bubbling up too. And so Tim, your husband comes up with this idea of a book called The Big Flute Influencers. And I go, what a great idea because it's never been done before. Yeah. And so he's the first to do it. And the book, in fact, Prior to the show today, I kind of kept jabbing at him. When is the book going to be done? And he says, well, if we, we're, we're in production. And I just kept pestering him. And finally, we see a real product. And so I'm just happy someone has, has gone forward with a book of this concept. And I think it's great because now you can get to know the many well-known investigators here in North America. And so... Getting back to the idea of the, his, the historical aspect of it, I think the only two people that are out there today, both older than me too, that have a really great historical perspective about Bigfoot today would be Lauren Coleman from Maine and Peter Byrne from Oregon. Uh, Peter Byrne is late 90s. I guess Lauren is mid 70s, but they've been around longer. And uh, so they have a developed perspective about the history of Bigfooting here in North America as well. Mm -hmm. And both happen to be in the book. Yeah. So. And they're both in the book. Yep. So, yeah, so we're excited about that. And Daniel, briefly, uh, after we came up with the book, Daniel had a, was at a, um, a conference in Michigan. And I, re I, I remember this. Uh, and he sends me a message because a gentleman came up to him. Well, you can tell a story about the, the word influencer. I, you're, you're catching me by surprise. Uh -oh. So you, you, I don't know if you, you were this, uh, you, you were speaking at the, an event in Michigan this past summer, I guess. Uh, uh, it was, a few, I think it was in May. Okay. In Michigan. And, and a gentleman came up to you and called, you said, call, I think he called you an influencer. Oh, yes. <laughs> Someone did say that. And I said, I think I replied to him. I said, funny you should say that because as we speak, someone is actually working on a book with that exact title. Yes, that's correct. There's someone, when I was giving my talk, I think it came up. It's either I mentioned it or someone in the audience made an inquiry. They said, well, what are the, some of the better books? And uh, I said, well, I think a good start would be John Green's Sasquatch, The Apes Among Us. That was published in 78. And so as I was giving my talk, this guy who was listening, because people do multitasking, he actually ordered the book online through his phone as I was talking. So I guess I influenced his decision and he bought a copy right there on the spot. <laughs> That's super cool. Um, so in reference to researching, what different, what do you see that the differences between the early, the early research techniques to today? Is there anything that's different that, that you've come across? Well, the best game changer play on words is the game cameras they use today. And I think that is really probably the best technology. And you have all these different type of cameras now. Uh, that you can deploy in the field and leave them there and monitor them remotely is I think that is the biggest technological change since the early days of Bigfooting because we didn't have any of that early on. Today we have that. And just drones with cameras that are affordable under a thousand dollars. And I know there are a couple of Bigfooters who already have them and that's a good way to get a, uh, some visual above the trees and looking in spots where you're camped in to see what's around you if something's circling your camp. So the drones with the camera, I think, is wonderful technology and also the game cameras. I think those are, quote unquote, game changers for today's Bigfooting. And I just said we haven't really had success yet 
but that doesn't mean we're not going to have success. Yeah. So I mean, here's, I'm sorry, Daniel. Just think of, you, go you know, back. We haven't captured anything yet on game cameras, but, you know, I think there are some people all, who also say, some researchers that, that somehow Sasquatches can pick up on the frequencies of these cameras and try to avoid them. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. That, that might be so because there was a scientific paper that uh, Cliff Barackman from Oregon forwarded to me a couple of years ago. And I think it was about coyotes in a certain area that they were trying to monitor with game cameras. And they seem to be able to sniff them out mm -hmm. in, in a maybe not a literal sense, but somehow sense that they were there and to avoid them. Hmm. So something like a coyote can sense and pick up this, uh, it is very likely that a Bigfoot might be able to sense that there's something very wrong with its immediate environment. So maybe they have a special sense uh, that can pick up on frequencies, almost like whales do underwater, or yeah. you know, even echolocation that dolphins and bats use, that maybe there's some kind of special sense that they have. Well, you, you take the position that Bigfoot is out there and they've been the world champion, hide and seek champion mm -hmm. all this time through 2022, then that should say something about them and their ability to stay away from anything that's going to harm them. And so it would seem likely that they might be able to pick up on game cameras. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, but possibly there might be some truth to that. Like I said, if coyotes can do it, why can't Bigfoot? Yeah. So, so t taking you know taking that to a different question that's kind of similar. So, in your opinion, I what do you think Sasquatches are? A primate. Mm -hmm. Everyone says they get into this heated debate whether it's ape-like or man-like, and I just said. Forget about that. As the late Rene de Hinden said, he says, until we get one, until that time, let's we'll compare notes after that time. But right now, let's just say something is out there. Of what it is, I don't know. Uh, I like to just say in the broadest terms that we have an unknown primate living in North America. A lot of people have different ideas what it might be. Neanderthal, Gigantopithecus, uh, Paranthropus, uh, and I'm saying, well, what's that based on? And it's just like, there's no real definitive answer, but primate is a big field, a big umbrella field that we're under as well. So I just said, it looks like we have an unknown primate and just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. So can you share with the audience uh, on the other side of the spectrum of the researchers who, and what they believe Bigfoot are, uh, can you explain what woo is and your thoughts on woo? I I didn't really hear about the term till just a few years ago, and I had to ask that person what exactly is woo. And I guess it kind of involves a Bigfoot that's spiritual, interdimensional, jumps on flying saucers and stuff like that. And I just don't subscribe to that idea because I don't think there's really evidence for it. I mean, if you had here in North America... 5,000 eyewitnesses who said that, oh yeah, I saw a Bigfoot and the next thing I saw, it boarded a flying saucer. And you have 5,000 witnesses just like that saying the same thing. Then I said, well, then maybe we should entertain that idea, but we don't. Mm -hmm. We just have an eyewitness saying that I saw something that looked like Bigfoot. When it saw me, it just walked the other direction into the woods and out of sight. Mm -hmm. that, that just, uh, to me, a natural animal of the planet. So I don't, I mean, I don't mind these people having these ideas, but I don't think it's grounded in anything factual or them being able to blink in and out of this universe. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me because you have gorillas, uh, whales, birds that do not do that. The, all the billions of people on the planet, they don't blink in and out from India to Canada and then back again. It just doesn't happen. 
So why would you think it would happen to Bigfoot just because it's unknown? I think that's mm -hmm. a cop-out. Here's a question. So this is something that I've just recently started becoming curious about in the past maybe six months. So do you think that there's any reason why the government would want to hide the existence of Bigfoot? No. Okay. But before I go too far on that, I would say maybe not so much the government, but private industry, the big timber industry in the Pacific Northwest and parts of North America, Canada included, I would say they're probably not too interested in recognizing officially Bigfoot because, I mean, the question is, would that shut down the timber industry or portions of it? And that's their livelihood. So I would but say- do you think like a lot of, I mean, a lot of corporations, big corporations, big businesses in America do affect how our government, uh, you know, sets policies and governs, unfortunately. Do you think that maybe the timber industry could have an influence on the government? Uh, yes, I think so, but I don't know if it's happened yet. It's mm -hmm. just, I think they're just, uh, I just think that big timber is probably big timber as a as a as a company is not interested in proving the existence of Bigfoot because they know what would happen to that industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look at the EV and electric vehicle industry, what it's eventually going to do to the oil industry. Mm -hmm. It's going to shrink that industry, especially with mandates and legislation stating, like in the state I live in, that by such, such and such a date in the state of California that we're going to have to turn over to EV to make it more climate friendly. And so, yeah, that would impact the oil industry. And so you think about it, if they found a Bigfoot tomorrow, that would definitely have an impact on big timber. So it, it's in their best interest not to want to see an official proven discovery. Right. So over the past 40 years, just kind of the, to keep that rolling. Have you had any moments where you, uh, you question whether they they do exist? No, no. I was lucky in 1979. I, it's either 1979 or 1980, but I believe it's 1979. Myself and Doug Trapp saw tracks <clears throat> in Hemet, California. Hemet, California is halfway in between San Diego and Los Angeles. I was still in high school at the time. And the tracks that we saw were on a creek that was made by rain. So after the rain would dry up, that creek would be gone. But we started looking around in an area and there they were. They were kind of eroded because the rain had kind of made some erosion. But there was this big heel print, no doubt what it was. It was basically to him and I, on first observation, no mistaking it. So I thought to myself, there had been reports in this area. We just happened to get damn lucky to see this. He tried to cast them. So uh, we were not successful in casting them, took a few pictures. But in 79 was my first view of physical evidence in the ground. And then in August of 1986 in the Menachee Meadows in the Sequoias, uh, I saw tracks again, but they were in sandy soil and were more than two weeks old, I think. And this was some bridge builders. And believe it or not, in August of 86, CNN obviously knew who I was because one of their reporters had called me and asked me something about it. And actually that was the first time I learned about those tracks out there or the sighting. And so I went out to go check it out. And so I'm interviewing the bridge builders who are making a footbridge over the, I guess it's the Kern River. And they said this thing came into their camp and they got out of the area. And then I'm doing a taped interview with them and they said, oh, and footprints were left too. Then I stopped the tape recorder and I said, footprints. And I said, can we see those now? And we did. And the tracks were a little over 13 inches long. 
Wow. But they were in sandy soil, so they weren't really that good. But that was the second time. This one seventy nine in 1986 is really the only time I've ever seen tracks. But that wow. was enough for me to convince me that they're out there. And so I have trouble with people who find tracks and have sightings all the time. Because normally, yeah, just for the average Bigfooters, they're lucky to see anything in a lifetime. And there are people without mentioning names who seem to see stuff all the time. And I scratch my head, I'm wondering, you know, is this real or are they making things up? I think the same thing. I tend to think the same. I feel like being able to witness uh, a live Bigfoot is almost like getting struck by lightning. Or winning so, the lottery. Exactly. Um, we, we did want to, we don't have a lot of time left, but we did want to talk to you about the Freeman footage. Tim, I know you had some questions. I did. That. So so what we did, Daniel, is we took an audience question. Mm -hmm. uh, not yet audience, obviously, because mm -hmm. this has been live broadcast. But uh, Dr. Kenny Brown sent us a question to ask you. And Dr. Kenny Brown is an uh, Ohio-based researcher, uh, re uh, investigator rather, with the Bigfoot Field Researchers, you know, organization. And he asked us. He says, "I'm going to read it here, and I'm going to do this without my glasses." Can you tell us your thoughts on the Paul Freeman footage, and your thoughts regarding all of the new clarifications and information from his son Michael Freeman's upcoming book? I don't have a copy of the book yet, but I want to read the book uh, first. But even before that, in the Bigfoot Times newsletter, we have addressed the Freeman footage on several occasions. And like I told Michael Freeman, Paul Freeman's son, is he asked me point blank via text. He says, so what do you think about the August 92 video that his dad shot? And I said, I'm skeptical. And that doesn't mean that my skepticism makes it real or unreal. It just means that I'm skeptical. I was there on the film site in July of this year, the first and only time just before the 30th anniversary. And so seeing the physical layout of the film site or the video site, I'm just saying, well, why did the subject go perpendicular to the cameraman, Paul Freeman? So basically walking from right to left when it could have just walked directly away, just going directly away and opposite of the cameraman to get into the woods and avoid them altogether. Instead, you have something that I wouldn't say purposely, but goes directly in front of the cameraman from right to left. And I'm saying, well, I guess an animal can do anything it wants, but generally they tend to go, if they're trying to get away from you, in the opposite direction as quickly as they can. But in this case, instead of going opposite in a way, it goes perpendicular straight in front of the camera like you're walking on a stage. You know, I can actually remember like we have woods behind our house and we like to go walking back there on the path. And I was uh, walking with a, a friend's dog that I was just kind of dog sitting. And we're starting on the path and you know, we're just walking along and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a huge buck and a doe cross the path right in front of us. I mean, it kind of gave, it, I could smell it, I could hear it, I could see it, and I and it ran off and it kind of, you know, shocked me and scared me for a second. It was gone. And I thought to myself, this is, this must be what it's like to have like a Bigfoot encounter. It's so quick. There was no way I would have been able to pull out my camera, but I, I experienced it. But it did run in front of us, like a, like perpendicular to in the pathway that we were walking, which it had plenty of space to run off. So you're, you're right in saying that animals can just kind of do whatever they want to do. Right. But the, the, yeah. other, the other thing about the Freeman footage, because it is a video, is that I don't necessarily have visual confidence in the subject is that you don't really see, you do see the subject as plain as day, but you really don't see the type of detail that you're hoping for because it doesn't appear that you have any visualization of muscles moving that you'd kind of expect. It, it just, the detail is not as you would hope. So 
to me, it's not visually compelling. And so, I mean, up to that time, 92, Paul Freeman had claimed quite a bit in terms of sightings. I think he had three sightings and footprints. And so after he got that August 92 video, at the time, Rene DeHinden, Bob Titmus, John Green, and Dr. Grover Krantz were all living, and not, not one of them dropped everything to go to that film site to go investigate. And so right there, that should tell you something about Paul Freeman in the sense that, as I expressed in the newsletter, that perhaps Paul Freeman had cried wolf far too many times for anyone to bother to get out and go check it out because no one did at the time. And so if they were really impressed, they would have went, but apparently because they didn't go, it would indicate that maybe they were not impressed. So they're probably, what you're saying is that they probably weren't impressed with the footage. And there's, and then there's also the possibility that he had cried wolf. So maybe he had actually seen the wolf this time and actually filmed it, but there's more doubt because of those factors. I mean, think about it. I mean, it's just like if they had any faith in Paul Freeman, especially Grover Krantz, who did have a lot of faith in Freeman, this why didn't he drop everything to go out and look? And he lives in Pullman, Washington, which is not that far from the film site. Mm -hmm. And it's just like he didn't go out to check it out. So mm -hmm. it really, it's just like what they're saying in their books or what Dr. Grover Krantz is saying in his book yeah, what I'm saying is their actions are not consistent with their writing. Mm -hmm. If they really believed there was a gold mine out there, why didn't they go out and try to mine it? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that really, that should, I mean, the action, the actions or lack of action by some of the early investigators on the Freeman film site, that should really be a head scratcher. Yeah. Right. And to this day, though, I can't tell you whether the Freeman footage is real or not real. I can only tell you that I'm skeptical. I mean, Freeman was there, but he's the late Paul Freeman is no longer with us. So I can't go up to him and ask him, hey, was that a man in a costume or was that the real deal? Right. I don't know. Only he knows. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, Daniel, I've got one one final question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up and we'll talk okay. about how people can contact you uh, what advice do you have for new researchers who want to get involved two things when you're in the woods have your either your camera phone or a camera with you at all times and I'm meaning even when you go to the restroom uh, and have a notepad and a pen so you could document things because when you say that, oh, I didn't actually measure something uh, that maybe you could take a stick and break it, how long a footprint is or whatever, and take it back with you and take notes as to what you saw in the ground or what you saw visually, the, those are the two things. Have a camera and have a notepad. That's my best advice to anyone out there who wants to get involved in the field. Okay, so Daniel, how, how can people keep up with you? Uh, go to the website, bigfoottimes.net. I will say that right now I'm doing a very ambitious project that's going to take several years just to get caught up. It's called Project Bigfoot Books, and we're listing every single book in the entire planet that has anything to do with Bigfoot. And so far we have about 830 books. And as the word gets out, more people are getting in touch with me and looking at the website and saying like, oh, that book is not listed. Here it is. Here's the cover of the book. Let's list it. And like I said, there's the monthly newsletter. If you want to get the newsletter, if you can't afford $20 a year, I, I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> awesome. Well, we want to thank you so much, Daniel. We're so excited that you are our first guest. Um, we, it wasn't easy to pick you out when we were thinking who we wanted to be our first. So we really appreciate it. 
Yeah, and, and folks, when you see Daniel out there, uh, make sure he autographs uh, the Bigfoot Influencers book because he's got a chapter in there. So make sure you get his autograph as well. Right. And Tim, why don't you tell everybody how to buy the book? We'll, we'll let Daniel have some more Oh, yeah. Go ahead, say. Daniel. Well, you could just type in Bigfoot Influencers on the webs any website and it'll pop up instantly. You know, it's easy to find things now on the web. Yeah. And just... Uh, type in Bigfoot Influencers and you'll find Tim's book. I would like to say one thing I'm very thankful for. I own, because I have the largest private Bigfoot library in the world, I own now the first shipped and autographed copy of the Bigfoot Influencers is in my possession, which Tim sent me. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sending it to me. Well, you're so welcome, Daniel. Just you've been such a pleasure and such a huge help with with the whole project. So I, I couldn't have done it without you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And um, here's my plug. If you, if anyone's interested in buying the book, uh, here's some places that you can buy it, and they they have they're all autographed copies, and uh, you know help support the local bookstores, support the folks that are out there uh, involved in the, in the subject. And just want to thank you again. So I guess you want to share how else people can follow us? Yeah. So first of all, I want to say that you can um, follow. So please like and subscribe to us on the Untold Radio um, YouTube channel. So if you could like and subscribe, that would be awesome. Um, you can find us on Facebook at the Bigfoot Influencers on Instagram as well, the Bigfoot Influencers. Twitter is is um, BF Influencers. And the website that you can find everything about the Bigfoot Influencers is the BigfootInfluencers.com. So thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at the next episode. And okay. thanks again, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Have a great night. Thank you for having me as your first guest. Absolutely. Thank you.